Strike him out, strike him out, smoke him in, smoke him in, strike him out, Ryan. Throw the heat, toss the curve, you have plenty in reserve. Smoke him in, strike him out, Ryan. Nolan, 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 though they're disapproving, keep that curveball moving, Ryan. Don't try to understand him, just rock and fire. Pop him up, strike him out, fly him out, ground him out, Ryan. Throw the heat, throw the change, keep the curveball out of range. Set him up, strike him out, Ryan. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Holtz, and throughout the history of Major League Baseball, fans have been mesmerized by pitchers who could literally overpower the opposition with their fastballs. Men like Walter Johnson, Bob Feller, Sandy Koufax, Bob Gibson, and sudden Sam McDowell. In the decade of the 80s, Roger Clemens and Dwight Gooden joined this elite group of strikeout artists, as did relief specialists Goose Gossage and Lee Smith. But when you're talking serious heat, the king of K's, one name stands alone, Lynn Nolan Ryan Jr. Facing a Nolan Ryan fastball is like trying to drink coffee with a fork. Noli. Big Tex. The Ryan Express. No one in Major League history has thrown harder than Nolan Ryan. I've never seen, that's the thing about I've never seen anyone throw harder than me. No, never have. I, I've played baseball for 23 years and I have never, ever seen anyone throw any harder than me. No one has thrown harder longer. I said uh, many, many times after watching him pitch, they should send his arm to the Smithsonian Institute when he's finished. Uh, how this man has been able to continue us year after year and throw the ball at the rate of speed that he has has to be one of the wonders of the world. At 22, Nolan Ryan was a fireballing right-hander for the amazing New York Mets, 1969 world champions. His fastball did more than just explode. Uh, it just, it got about halfway and uh, just kind of would disappear. Batters couldn't believe what was going on. At 42, Nolan Ryan was a fireballing right-hander for the Texas Rangers, leading the major leagues in strikeouts and limiting the opposition to a cumulative batting average of just 187. People, they talk about me as doing the things that I, that I do, I really don't consider myself in the same class with Nolan. Because here, this guy is, he's, he's in his 40s. Sorry, Nolan. But, um, and he is out pitching better than anyone in uh, baseball. In a major league career that has spanned four teams in four decades, Nolan Ryan has been nothing less than spectacular. He's posted five no-hitters and over 5,000 strikeouts. I, I could not project a Nolan Ryan. Uh, a scout cut doesn't get this good. He says to protect himself, says he has a chance to play in the major leagues. Well, Nolan Ryan knocked the door down, and he went clear through the building and kicked the back door in. He's done it all. There's no chance that 
in my time there'll ever be another Nolan Ryan. And there may not be one ever. Nolan Ryan's fastball has made him a household name, a magazine cover boy, the toast of both coasts. But away from the baseball diamond and the glare of the media spotlight, the man who makes his living in the fast lane prefers a life that's a yeah, little Nolan slower. Ryan, now this is the, high, the little league field that uh, I played little league baseball on and then my, my two sons have played on. He still lives in his hometown of Alvin, Texas, a quiet rural community which sits 30 miles south of Houston toward the Texas Gulf Coast. He's still married to his high school sweetheart. She was the tennis champ and beauty queen. He was the sports star and most handsome. We had our first date when I was 13 and he was 15. And then we dated through high school. And then Nolan went into minor league baseball. And after I graduated from high school, we got married. That was in 1967. The Ryans, together with their three children, Reed, Reese, and Wendy, live in a ranch-style house on the outskirts of town. The family schedule revolves around sports, the games the children play, while a proud mom and pop look on from the bleachers. Nolan's other love is ranching. He operates a cattle breeding program that will serve as a second career for him when he finally turns off the heat and gets out of baseball. We run about a thousand head of uh, breeding age cattle and uh, we're in a cow-calf operation, I have a cow-calf operation and we have three ranches located uh, uh, in South Texas and uh, from the coast uh, as far west as uh, the Catula area down in LaSalle County, so we're spread out, and uh, um, it's something I've always enjoyed. And um, I didn't grow up on a ranch; I grew up in town, but it's something I always was attracted to, and and I have been in it since 1972. Like most Texas youngsters, Nolan Ryan grew up playing football, but his gridiron career would prove short-lived. Maybe we call a young man named Norman Bulosh. He played for Miami Dolphins, and Norman played the same year as Nolan did over at Lamar. And he, he ended Nolan's career. He, uh, Nolan was playing defensive halfback for us, and Norman Bulosh ran over him in a game and hurt him. <laughs> and I don't think Nolan put on another suit after that. Once I realized that uh, uh, my, I didn't have any future in football, and my goal really became was to go to uh, college on a uh, basketball scholarship, and that was my first love was uh, basketball. And so. That's what I really worked towards, and I probably could have played college basketball, but my baseball ability overshadowed my basketball ability. Basketball's loss was baseball's game. Nolan was a tall, skinny right-hander who lacked polish and finesse, but even though he weighed just 150 pounds, he had a blistering fastball. But he threw so hard uh, that I didn't have anyone who could catch him. I had to spend my summers working on catchers for the following year. That's, it's, that's not an exaggeration. That's, that's the real truth. My attitude about pitching uh, in uh, amateur baseball was that, that that's the only way I knew how to pitch was just throw as hard as I could for as long as I could. And uh, uh, it was very effective uh, because we played all night games. There were bad lights and I was quite wild. And, the, you know, the kids uh, were more concerned about getting hurt than they were about getting base hits. Nolan's incredible arm caught the sharp eye of New York Met scout Red Murph. Nolan came in and warmed up in the first few pitches. It was almost unbelievable. He was throwing the ball 95 to 100 miles an hour, and I could tell he was a, a youngster. And he did convince me that day that he had the best arm that I'd ever seen in my life. In 1965, based on Red Murph's recommendation, the Mets drafted Ryan in the eighth round. He was the 295th player taken. He signed for a bonus package of around $20,000 and was shipped off to the minors where he wasted no time in showing his magical right arm. At Marion, Virginia in the Appalachian League, he fanned 115 batters in just 78 innings. At Greenville in the Carolina League, he whiffed 272. At Williamsport in double-A ball, he struck out 21 batters in one game. The minor league hitters were simply overmatched, and the legend was beginning to grow. When he got to the majors, Nolan was more a thrower than a pitcher. He was a diamond in the rough. But on occasion, oh, how that diamond could shine. It was not unusual for Nolan to throw a curveball that almost would bounce on the grass or to throw the next curveball over the top of me. Uh, and yet here was a guy who would uh, be wild up and in or be wild low in the way, and all of a sudden the next pitch throw in the corner on the black of the plate as we refer to it. 
And I mean, you had no contest. There was no contest at that point. You know, we had a great group of young pitchers uh, early with the New York Mets. It was uh, Gary Gentry, of course, Nolan, uh, Jerry Kuzman, myself, uh, a lot of guys that could throw hard. But I think uh, all of us recognize that Nolan probably had the most physical ability to throw the ball. I mean, it was really a very fine line with, with all of us. Kuzman threw extremely hard. Uh, uh, and when I was young, I was able to throw the ball fairly hard. But I think more than anybody else, no, we all felt that Nolan was a guy that could throw it the hardest. Ryan's finest hour with the Mets came in the third game of the 69 World Series against Baltimore. In game three, the Mets took a 4-0 lead into the seventh. But starter Gary Gentry faltered, loading the bases with two outs. Manager Gil Hodges then summoned Ryan from the bullpen. Now all of a sudden here we're in the third game of a World Series. It's even at one and one. And, you know, here comes Nolan Ryan out of the bullpen and people are going, oh my goodness, you know, has Gil gone completely off his rocker? And all, all Nolan did was just completely shut him down. Ryan earned a save and a game ball, but it didn't come easy. Tommy Agee's sensational catch stopped the Orioles in the seventh. And in the ninth, Ryan loaded the bases before fanning Paul Blair to end the game. He got Paul Blair on with two strikes and threw a curveball at Paul Blair. And Paul Blair's knees buckled. I mean, they, he wanted not, he, he just knew this was a fastball that was going to fix and kill him. And his knees just buckled, and the ball broke across the middle of the plate, and it was all over. Ryan would enjoy other moments of brilliance as a Met. But on a staff dominated by Seaver and Kuzman, he couldn't get the innings he needed to develop. In 1972, along with outfielder Lee Stanton and catcher Francisco Estrada and pitcher Don Rose, he was traded to the California Angels for shortstop Jim Fregosi. Manager Del Rice gave Nolan the ball every fourth day and stuck with him. The steady work, plus help with mechanics from pitching coach Tom Morgan, resulted in a breakthrough season. Against the Red Sox, he struck out eight consecutive batters. He won 19 games, tossed nine shutouts, and led the American League in strikeouts with 329. His ERA was a glittering 228. Most impressive of all was the number he did on opposing hitters, holding them to a batting average of just 171. Ryan had arrived as one of the dominant pitchers in the game, and 1973 was to be his banner year. On May 15th at Kansas City, Ryan pitched his first major league no-hitter, blanking the Royals 3-0. As always, he piled on the Ks, and the Angels gave him all the defense he needed. Center fielder Bobby Valentine made a nice running grab. Shortstop Rudy Mioli's over-the-shoulder catch was the only close call. To prove that effort was no fluke, Ryan came back on July 15th and no-hit the Detroit Tigers 6-0. On this day, Ryan was truly awesome. His first pitch was a sharp breaking curveball that hit umpire Ron Luciano in the shin. When Nolan has this kind of stuff, the batters are simply overmatched. He struck him out looking. He struck him out swinging. He fanned him with a heat. He got him with a curve. It was no contest as Nolan Ryan rang up 17 strikeouts. He was so overpowering that day, and uh, it was... Uh the last man to come to the plate that, that always sticks out in my mind and that was the late one cash somewhere he went back into the underneath the stands or somewhere at tiger stadium and uh, came to the plate with a piano leg. and uh, that was it instead of a bat he had a piano leg and i mean that's how much in command and how much of a joke that the tigers were making of it they said this guy is just yeah i mean he's unhittable umpire luciano made cash use a real bat but piano leg, table leg, or Louisville slugger, it made no difference as Cash went down to end the game. Also a record time strikeout performance. Here it comes. He pops it up. A tough play. No hitter for Nolan Ryan. Ryan has of all the no hitters, I think that one by far was the most dominating. I had probably the best curveball and uh, command of my fastball in that game. Uh, more so than, say, any of the others. As the year progressed, Nolan piled on the wins and piled on the strikeouts, and some important records were within reach. I think that my, my principal goal is to win 20 games, but if I can win 20 games and also uh, uh, set a new strikeout record, I'm definitely going to try. Rube Waddell's American League mark of 349 Ks fell against Texas, and catcher Jeff Torborg's glove was lost in Boston. 
We were in Boston, and it was very close to the end of the season, and Nolan was pitching, and there was a runner at third base, and all of a sudden, he fires a high fastball just up around my shoulder height. I felt it hit the glove, and I hear the crowd roar, and the runner starts at a plate, and I look in my glove. He had thrown it right through the webbing. It broke right through and hit the, hit the backstop on a fly. <laughs> my concern at that point was not that the runner had scored, but what had happened if it were right in front of me, you know? I would have, I'd be speaking through my chest. In September, Nolan beat Minnesota for his 20th win. But going into his final start, once again facing the Twins, he was 15 strikeouts shy of Sandy Koufax's Major League season record of 382 K. In the beginning, it didn't look like Ryan would make it past the first inning as the Twins got to him for three quick runs. But Nolan steady and his awesome competitive fire began to burn. The 11th inning would be it. With two outs and Rich Reese at the plate, Nolan summoned all his strength. Fastball swung out and missed strike three. The record was Ryan. A spectacular accomplishment made all the more remarkable when you stop and consider 1973 was the first year of the designated hitter. Uh, when you talk about a, a guy that, that uh, set the all-time season record for strikeouts, uh, just the physical ability and the physical stamina that he showed in the, in the season that he struck out 383 men is really incredible. Ryan finished the year at 21-16. And in a remarkable display of power and consistency, he struck out 10 or more in a game, a record 23 times. Was Nolan the fastest gun in baseball? Well, in 1974, scientists from Rockwell International decided to find out. At the time, it was generally accepted that Bob Feller held a speed record with a clocking of 98.6 miles per hour done by the U.S. Army. So breaking the record would be a tall order indeed. To clock Ryan's pitches, the Rockwell technicians set up a battery of sophisticated measuring equipment. Once again, Nolan came through in the clutch. In the ninth inning on a 3-2 fastball to B.B. Richard, he was clocked at 100.9 miles per hour the fastest pitch ever thrown. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. You can look it up. On September 28, 1974, Nolan joined the short list of pitchers with three career no-hitters as he shut out the Twins. Playing for a last place team, he wound up the year with 22 wins. And get this, three times he struck out 19 in a game, finishing the year with 367 Ks. On June 1st, 1975, at Anaheim, Ryan no-hit Baltimore to join Sandy Koufax as the only two pitchers with four no-hitters. The legend continued to grow. I was riding to the bus in one of my first years in the major leagues, and Oscar Gamble was with us with the uh, Cleveland Indians. We were riding in the bus, and the, and the marquee outside of Anaheim Stadium said, uh, pitching today for the Angels, Nolan Ryan. And Oscar saw the sign along with everybody on the bench, and he said, uh-oh, good day today is 0 for 4 and don't get hit in the head. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the sentiment, just take your 0 for and get out of there. Pitchers with this kind of stuff, you know, um, can do most anything they want to do, you know. Uh, if he got great stuff, you know, uh, he's going to go out there and beat your ball game, one nothing. He's going to go out there and probably pitch a no-hitter. After eight record-setting seasons with the Angels, Nolan Ryan returned to the National League in 1980. He signed a free agent contract with the Houston Astros and in the process became baseball's first million dollar man. Nolan Ryan had come home. To be able to live at home year round, I felt like for my family's uh, sake that it was probably for the best interest of them. A year later, as the Astros battled the Los Angeles Dodgers for the Western Division title, baseball's top gun notched another record in his belt. On September 26th, in the Dome, with a national television audience hanging on every pitch, Ryan pitched his record fifth no-hitter, shutting out the Dodgers five to nothing. The stage was set for him with a Saturday afternoon game late in the season against the Dodgers, the team we were contending for in the West for the 1981 split season, uh, strike-shortened season title. And uh, NBC was covering the game, and he just, he just took over. In the seventh inning, Dodgers catcher Mike Socia sent a ball deep to the right center field alley. But Astros outfielder Terry Poole made a fine running catch. 
Otherwise, Ryan dominated. In the ninth inning, with a crowd roaring on every pitch, he fanned Reggie Smith. Then he got Ken Landro to ground out. The final batter was the dangerous Dusty Baker. The count was 2-2. Ryan tossed Baker a curveball, and Baker shot a grounder to third. Uh, I hadn't had a ground ball yet, and I'm thinking, man, I better not boot this thing if it comes to me, and Dusty Baker was hitting, and sure enough, here comes a ground ball to me, and I, I treated it like a hot potato. I got rid of it as quickly as I could. I didn't want, want to hold on to it too long. And... It was the first opportunity that uh, my mother got the uh, chance to see one of the no-hitters as she was in the stands that day, and so... Um, uh, there were some special things about it that uh, didn't happen in the other ones. Baseball's records are, of course, made to be broken. But Ryan's fifth no-hitter is yet another of his feats that is unlikely to be challenged in the foreseeable future. It's a standard that, uh, to me, will never be eclipsed. Uh, and it's very difficult to use that kind of a word in sports when you say never. But I don't think anyone will ever score 100 points in basketball. I don't think anyone will ever have a 56-game hitting streak. And I don't think anybody will ever have five no-hitters. Someone may have six, but he's in Texas now. Ryan won his 200th game on July 22nd, 1982. And now looming on the horizon was another of baseball's most famous standards, Walter Johnson's Major League career record, 3,508 strikeouts. The Ryan Express was chasing the big train, and it would be like a bullet train racing a steam locomotive. No contest. On April 17, 1983, Andre Dawson of the Montreal Expos became victim 3,500. Ten days later, at Montreal's Olympic Stadium, Ryan would get the record. In the eighth inning, he struck out Tim Blackwell to tie Johnson. The next batter was pinch hitter Brad Mills. Strike one. Strike two. Ball one. A backdoor curveball. Strike three. I got a lot of personal satisfaction out of that because when I broke into baseball, uh, that was one of the records they thought would never fall, as they thought Babe Ruth would. For Ryan, the record signified both durability and command of his pitches. He could still bring the heat but he was much more than a one-trick pony. A lot of people talk about Nolan Ryan being able to throw hard. What they forget about is the fact that he had one of the most vicious curveballs ever shown in the game of baseball. So could you imagine hitting off a guy who could throw the ball as hard as he does and then have to worry about him having an outstanding curveball to go along with it? Ryan continued to write his name in the strikeout ledger, posting his 4,000th K in July of 1985. That was against the Mets here uh, in the Dome, and it was uh, against Danny Heap. And I think the, the ironic part of that was I was out uh, doing my running prior to warming up in the game that night, and Danny was in the lineup, and he was out doing his sprints and getting loose. And he came by me and says, you're not getting me tonight for 4,000. And uh, lo and behold, who comes to the plate <laughs> was Danny in. Then he chased the curveball down uh, for strike three. And I think I got more satisfaction out of that than uh, I did the Johnson record because then when I broke Johnson's record, 4,000 was the furthest thing in my mind. And I really didn't think that, uh, uh, well, I just didn't anticipate playing long enough to do that. And as if things weren't tough enough for National League hitters, Ryan perfected a changeup to go with his fastball and curve. And his changeup is like a, it's like an 87 mile an hour screwball. Uh, he threw a pitch uh, one time. Uh, the hitter was Jason Thompson, Pittsburgh, three and two. He threw him about five or six straight fastballs, all in the upper 90s. Then he threw him a changeup on three and two. Thompson was so far out in front of the pitch that he threw his bat and it landed out in the Pirates' dugout. And after the game, I asked the guy with the radar gun how fast the pitch was, and he said it was 87 miles an hour. Well, you, can you imagine? Most guys don't throw their fastball that fast. On the mound, Ryan was a study in concentration, a stoic, fierce competitor. But occasionally, he'd show a lighter side. Astros battery mate Alan Ashby remembers Ryan's impromptu imitation of Cincinnati's pitcher Brad Leslie. 
a man known as the animal. And he would, every time he'd strike somebody out, he'd go out there and just yell after the strikeout. And Nolan had watched about enough of it, and he decided he was going to do it. And the last person on earth he would ever expect to do that was Nolan Ryan. And he went and struck somebody out and just came off the mound and yelled. And both teams, both benches, totally fell out laughing. And it's the sort of thing that if anybody else had done, I think the other team would have taken offense to. But they fell out laughing and applauded him, and the game went on. Those who know Nolan well all speak of his sense of humor. But this is a man who would rather entertain the fans with his pitching than with jokes. During Ryan's days with the Astros, everyone knew he could pitch, but he wasn't much of a hitter. In fact, he once went 42 trips without a hit, but he did hit a couple of home runs. You could look it up. As the 80s drew to a close, Ryan neared the allegedly untouchable total of 5,000 strikeouts. Most people, Ryan included, probably thought that historical moment would occur in an Astros uniform, but they were wrong. At age 42, starting his 23rd season in the majors, Nolan Ryan found himself headed back to the American League with a new address, Arlington Stadium, home of the Texas Rangers. Unable to reach a new agreement with the Astros, Ryan became a free agent after the 88 season and signed with Texas. I'm excited about the Rangers. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to uh, stay in Texas, play with a ball club, uh, that is going to be very competitive uh, and have my family in a situation that I think is uh, uh, the most workable situation for us. And with Nolan Ryan leading the way, the Rangers got out of the gate quickly, playing aggressive, exciting baseball. The heat was on. When he's on, Ryan is almost unhittable. He throws a rising fastball that seems to hop over hitters' bats. His curveball seems to fall off the end of a table. Is it real or is it illusion? How does Ryan make major league hitters look so bad? Well, elementary, my dear Watson, it's scientific. Robert Adair, the Sterling Professor of Physics at Yale, 
explains. It's like many things. Anytime you try to explain something complicated simply, you always lie a little. <laughs> but uh, here is a way of thinking about it. As a ball goes through the air, the force, resistive force on the ball increases as the velocity increases, indeed about as a square. So as the ball goes twice as fast, the resistive force is four times as large, approximately. Now let's say the ball is spinning, and we'll have a Mr. Nolan Ryan fastball. So the ball is spinning as it goes towards you like this. You can see as it goes through the air, the bottom of the ball is going faster through the air than the top. So the forces on the bottom of the ball are larger than the forces on the top of the ball. Ergo, the ball is pushed upwards by those forces. Uh, let us say that you're all set for the regular, very fast, 90 mile an hour fastball of the ordinary catcher. Now, Mr. Ryan's ball comes at the trajectory, starts out just the direction you're used to from this 90 mile an hour fastball. When the ball's half foot from the halfway to the plate, Mr. Ryan's fastball will be about an inch and a quarter higher. Well, that's not very much. When it's 15 feet from the plate, it'll be about two inches higher. By the time it crosses the plate, it'll be four inches higher and uh, goes hop right over your bat. <laughs> so the, his fastball rises in comparison with the trajectory of an ordinary fastball. The Nolan Ryan uh, curveball is much more of a drop than a, a sideways. And tactically, that's what major league pitchers want to throw, the ball so that it drops. And uh, now they will have maybe 1,400, maybe even a little more, revolutions per minute in just the opposite direction. So instead of curving five inches up, uh, it will curve even more downwards. It'll curve more downwards because it'll be going slower. And uh, the batter who's waiting for the Nolan Ryan fastball, <laughs> then that curve comes up, he's got big troubles. <laughs> Professor Adair knows physics, but Nolan knows pitching. I grip all my pitches differently. A lot of people try to grip their pitches the same so they can take the sign with the ball behind their back and not have to worry about hiding it. Uh, I throw my fastball. I throw, I'm, I'm different from a lot of people is that uh, I don't have real long fingers and I throw the ball back in my hand. There's not a lot of gap there. I don't get it out on my fingertips like that. So I throw it like that and I throw my fastball with all four seams, so when the ball comes off like that, it has a good tight rotation, and you want the ball to, to appear that it has a ride to it, or as you hear people say, a rising fastball. What it is, it just doesn't drop as fast as other ones. And uh, so that's basically how I throw uh, my fastball. Sometimes if I want to try to run it in on a hitter, I'll throw it with a two-seam fastball. And because of the way it comes out, you'll get more movement on the ball, either in or, or in on a right-hander or away from a left-hander. Now, I don't throw a slider, but I throw a curveball, and I, I choke it a lot like that in my hand. And this finger here just lays on the ball. There's no pressure on it. Your, your pressure points are on this finger here and on your thumb. And the only difference in a, a fastball release and a, and a breaking ball release is, is your wrist position. People think you twist your wrist and, and snap the ball, but you don't. On a fastball, the ball comes through like this. On a curveball, the only difference is you turn your wrist. And it comes out on a curveball, it comes out like this. Where on a fastball, it comes out with your hand behind it like this. So it's just your wrist position, curveball to a fastball. Now my changeup, and my changeup I learned to learn to grip on it. I always had a problem with my changeup throwing it too hard and being inconsistent. Changeup needs to be 10 to 15 miles an hour uh, slower than the velocity on your fastball. Really it needs to be 15 below, <clears throat> but if you throw it down at 10 miles an hour it's very effective. So I use it as a rule of thumb. It has to be below 10 miles an hour and it has to be down by the knees. And I throw mine what they call circle change and I hold it like that, where this finger isn't even on the ball, and I hold it tight. And the ball comes out of my hand. You throw it with your position the same, your wrist position as a fastball. And when it comes out, it comes off like this. And my middle finger here is the last release point on the ball. Well, I put it on this seam to try to get it to come out that way. 
So it has, what it has is this type of rotation. And what it'll do is it'll also sink and act kind of like a screwball to a left-hander. And uh, it's been a very effective pitch for me, and it's gotten better and better. Now, fortunately, most of us will never have to face a Nolan Ryan fastball or try to get a bat on one of his wicked curves. But we thought you might want to actually feel the heat. So we rigged up a special Ryan cam to let you experience the sensation. What do you think? Those major league hitters earn their money when they bat against Nolan. Talking about Nolan Ryan's pitches is easy. As American League hitters discovered, the hard part is hitting them. Nolan fan Bo Jackson six great times before Bo finally connected and sent a Ryan fastball flying back to the center field bleachers. On June 14th, facing California for the first time, Ryan became the sixth major league pitcher in history to beat all 26 major league teams. In his next appearance, the 89 All-Star Game, Ryan got another win. He pitched two scoreless innings, struck out three, and became the oldest winning pitcher in All-Star Game history. On August 10th, facing Detroit at Arlington Stadium, Ryan again flirted with his sixth no-hitter. This time, Dave Bergman played the spoilers role in the ninth inning. But Nolan Ryan's near no hitters, exciting in their own right, seem secondary to the main storyline for 1989, strikeouts. By mid-August, Ryan was rapidly closing in on 5,000 career Ks. Research books flew open. Statisticians and sabermetricians took to the microfilm and the microfiche. Baseball folks put the pencil to every strikeout Nolan Ryan had ever recorded. What did they find? Alphabetically, Ryan had whiffed players from A, Hank Aaron, to Z, Paul Zuvella. He had struck out 19 Hall of Famers and 44 league MVPs. The father and son tandems Ryan had faced and fanned included the Alomars, Sandy and Roberto, the Bonds, Bobby and Barry, the Franconas, Tito and Terry, the Griffies, Ken and Ken Jr., the Schofields, Dick and Dick Jr., and the Wills, Maury and Bump. Ryan's strikeouts included a Porter, a Cooper, a Baker, a Miller, and a Doc. He set down a bird, a bass, a boa, a deer, a moose, and a penguin. His victims included Law and Orta. He fanned a king, a duke, an earl, and a count. Ryan got the best of one blue, three greens, and four whites. He left everyone seeing red. And finally, research showed the answer to the trivia question, who was Nolan Ryan's first strikeout victim? September 11th, 1966, Atlanta Braves pitcher, Pat Jarvis. Ryan's date with destiny came down to August 22nd, 1989 at Arlington Stadium against the Oakland A's. The Dallas-Fort Worth area hummed with excitement. Baseball commissioner A. Bartlett Giamatti flew in for the historic occasion and watched the game with Rangers managing general partner George W. Bush. The eyes of the baseball world were on Texas. I think uh, I probably felt uh, more anxiety going into that game than uh, probably uh, any other game that I can really recall because everybody came there, the build-up, the fact the stadium was sold out, and I knew a lot of people had come a long ways to see that event. And I need six strikeouts, and the last thing I wanted to do was have a disappointing performance and not accomplish that. And uh, not that I was anticipating that, but uh, I think looking at things realistically, that uh, uh, I'd have been devastated if, if I hadn't accomplished it that night. Needing six strikeouts to reach 5,000, Ryan swiftly went to work. In the first inning, he K'd Jose Canseco with a curve. 
In the second inning, he buzzed a 95-mile-per-hour fastball past Dave Henderson and got Tony Phillips to chase an 0-2 curve. In the third inning, Ricky Henderson swung through a 93-mile-an-hour fastball. Then on a 1-2 count to Ron Hassey, Ryan smoked a 96-mile-per-hour heater. All Hassey could do was watch. Hassey had been number 4,999. The only question remaining was which of his teammates would be next. Leading off the fifth for Oakland was Ricky Henderson, a perennial all-star, one of the most exciting, explosive players in the game. Ryan started him off with 95-mile-an-hour smoke. Outside corner at the knees, strike one. Then came a 94-mile-an-hour fastball on the outer half, strike two. For a franchise that had moved to Texas nearly two decades earlier and in the interim had little to brag about, the moment had come. Ryan, going for the jugular, fired a belt-high fastball on the outer edge. He missed one and two. Then he snapped off a curve that sailed just wide, 2-2. Two -two. As light flashes showered the Texas sky, Henderson fouled the next pitch, a fastball back. Then he laid off a Ryan curveball that didn't bite and came in a bit tight, a full count. Reaching back a bit extra, Ryan came in with his money pitch, the this big the heat. full count in a row for Ryan. Here's the payoff pitch. He struck him out swinging. Strikeout number 5,000 is history for Nolan Ryan. It came down with Ricky being the quality hitter that he is that it, uh, I had to make uh, the pitch I wanted, and it was a fastball low and away, and from a pitcher standpoint, it was a perfect pitch. And how did the fastest fastball pitcher of all time react? In true Ryan fashion, he simply doffed his cap. He accepted congratulations from his catcher and his infielders, but his actions made it clear he wanted to play ball. There was still a game to be won, though in fact, Texas lost that night 2-0. But the final score wasn't the important number of the evening. 5,000 was. It's a record that hopefully will be broken in baseball, but it's hard to imagine somebody doing it. And uh, what a thrill. It was, I was a six-year-old kid at the same time I was a 43-year-old owner of the Rangers. Ryan's last appearance came on September 30th at the Big A in Anaheim. They got a three-hit shutout, 57th of his career, and his 16th win of the season, his most since 1982. And he got 300 strikeouts, bringing up Dick Schofield for the big one. The season ended on a high note with a promise of even more memorable moments ahead in the 1990s. How then do you measure a Nolan Ryan? Unquestionably, the Ryan Express is bound for the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. He's got the arm, he's got the numbers, he's got the respect. Every time I stepped in the batter's box against Nolan Ryan, I always felt it was power against power and appreciated and, and, and relished the privilege of facing a guy who I knew threw harder than anyone that ever breathed. He has taken a God-given talent and through hard work harnessed it and developed its full potential. Well, ability-wise, uh, Nolan's as good a pitcher as ever uh, put on a uniform. He not only throws his fastball faster than, uh, his curveball breaks better than, and now he has a changeup that is the envy of uh, all of baseball. He is a man true to his roots, a country boy who loves the land, cherishes his small town values, and gives back to his community. Nolan Ryan is a Texas hero. He is a guy who is a embodies all of what Texans believe in, which is hard work and family and faith. He is a family man, a devoted husband and father, a man of integrity. Talk about straight arrows. Nolan Ryan is the straight arrow of our time. One day, Nolan will walk off the mound for the final time, and he will be missed. For Nolan Ryan is one of a kind. Mm -hmm.